Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Peter Bryant. I'm the Head of Learning Technology and Innovation here at the London School of Economics. And welcome to our, I think, third Network Ed for this academic year. And for those of you who are attending your first Network, network Ed, welcome. Uh, the theme of this year's series, and we, we were thinking a lot about this, uh, was to focus the, uh, the interest and the debate around technology and education on the uncertain futures of the higher education. It's been a traumatic couple of years just over lunch. We mentioned the word that shall only be mentioned once, I believe, uh, which is Brexit, plus all the changes around the Higher Education Act and all the changes around the competition that will be driving the way the sector will look over the next decade or two. This has been a tumultuous period of time for the higher education sector. And one of the things that we wanted to do as we, cura as we curated this was to think about the different voices in that, in that field. It's very easy to become part of an echo chamber of, of people who go, no, it's all going to be brilliant and it's all going to be wonderful. Um, or, you know, we're all in university so we all know what we're all experiencing. So uh, it is with that context that I'd like to introduce our speaker this afternoon, who is Liz Sprode who is the head of edu uh, Google Education for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Um, if I've got the A correct. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Being Australian, I would always add either Asia or Australia and drag us that way. Um, who's going to be talking, as you can see on the screen, on the topic of Generation Z is coming to your university. Are you ready? And without further ado, I shall hand over to you. Great. Thank you. And uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Um, Higher education looks quite different from when I went to university and to exemplify that I'm going to show you what I looked like when I went to university, right? So, like, not that different. <laughs> it's been less than 30 years since I went to university, but more than 20. And um, obviously in that time it's changed dramatically. I think I was amongst the last uh, graduates from university who somewhat were guaranteed a career. And I remember at the time that I was signing up to go to my university, having lots of conversations with my mum. Right? My mum wanted me to do law and I wanted to do English because I loved English. Um, and perhaps in the back of my mind, I knew that there was some surety for my future if I studied English and came from it. And to be frank with you, that has really realised itself for me. I was the first person in my family to go to university and there's no doubt that the opportunities that it's presented from that point forward have been, have been absolutely amazing. I could never, ever have imagined I would be standing in front of you doing the job that I have today. So, all good. Um, I was actually asked to go back to my university about a month ago and speak on uh, International Women's Day. And they were asking me lots of questions about, well, what did you get out of being at university? And I think I got the answer wrong because uh, well, I got a degree, right? That's what I got from university. Um, what I probably didn't really realise at the time, and when I reflect back, probably can't remember that well, were all the wider skills that I received from being there. And some of that may be to do with how I was taught and the subject that I did, but it was probably also true that I wasn't explicitly told and informed about those other skills that, were, were that I was gaining. And that's something I feel really passionate about because I think those other wider skills are really vital to our future and increasingly the students that are going to be coming to your university. But there were other changes, changes that you guys know all too well, right? There were new buildings. <laughs> there was a great new library. It was super modern. It was equipped with all the latest equipment. Um, and I reflected over lunch that there were different kinds of spaces and that encouraged me. There were spaces that perhaps didn't look quite like this that's going on here. Spaces that instilled collaborative ways of working. So that was nice to see. There was an incredibly high growth in the student population. And when you reflect on the fact that the cost of provision and who's paying for higher education with the fact that there's increasing student population, that was, that was super interesting to me to see that change. And it's also true that the student profile at the university I went to, the kinds of employment opportunities and where they physically came from had changed 
really quite fundamentally since I, I had left. So, you know, the other observation about higher education is it's, it's actually not a homogenous sector by any means. Each university has a very different profile by virtue of its physical location and, of course, all of those rankings that exist. But I think there are some common themes, pressures and challenges, especially at the moment, that every university here in the UK can relate to. We've got REF and TEF, new names for things that I knew a while ago. Um, we have that much more consumer-oriented student culture. I'm paying, therefore I have certain expectations of what I'm about to receive. And there is Brexit. <laughs> There we go, it's said, said twice. You know, what's the impact of that going to be on the level of EU money we get? And how will it affect the view, view of London as a, as a destination for our overseas students? So what about technology? Wow. Well, that's equally changed a lot, right? Um, does anybody recognise? Well, it's not a typewriter. It's a word processor. Do we ever say word processor anymore? So I, though I was an English student, I had a word processor, which made me think that I was really ahead of the game, right? I had a word processor. And my word processor had this little tiny, tiny screen here. And if you were really careful and you really watched the screen, you could just about catch the, uh, the grammatical errors or the typos before I sent it to, to print. Um, so a little bit different. And this was my experience of the university using technology. This was, I think it was EBSCO back then, but it was the research database that showed me in the library where my physical copy of the article was that I needed to read. And it would chuck out a code and I'd have to go and delve through the floors on the library to find my physical article. It's kind of bizarre. It's only 1994 that I left. So what does it look like now quite different right so we're facing a world where the students coming to your university um, will have grown up with technology unlike me they will know what YouTube Google Facebook snapchat all of these things these things are so I wanted to try and get us in the mood to try and help us appreciate and realise what it feels like to be a Generation Z student. So we're going to do a couple of exercises. So you're ready? So you're going to need some things. I need you to get your mobile phone and hold it up. So test one, do we all have a mobile phone? You, if you're, I'm not going to know unless you hold it up high. And it's fine if you left it on your desk. Though, gosh, I hope it's secure, right? <laughs> Okay, good. So test one, largely, we all have a mobile phone. <coughs> I want you to unlock it. So mine's already unlocked. And then I want you to give it to the person sitting next to you. <laughs> what? What's that? What's going on? What's going on? No? You don't want to do that? Oh, these guys over here, right? Are you married or no? You're not married? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wow, I, li I like the trusting relationship you formed. It's amazing. Well done. <laughs> wow, okay, well, uh, guys. <laughs> I think I think we had we had uh, we had a 98 percent success. Now that's wrong mathematically, but I did English, so we had a 98 percent success rate in that exercise. <laughs> so you all have a mobile phone, and two people actually did share their mobile phones, which is amazing. We're not going to do that, right? Why would you do that? I don't even give my mobile phone to my husband. <laughs> So, you know, that has become ubiquitous. It defines who we are. Amazing. So much information stored in that one place. It never leaves us. I think we had a handful of people somewhere at the back who actually didn't have their mobile phones with them. So, you know, we passed that part, right? We're young, we're hip, we know what's going on. We're part of Generation Z. Maybe, but uh, 
Maybe not. So if we try to define Generation Z, and this is by no means an academic attempt to do that, so forgive me, these are the people who have grown up with technology from day one. They don't remember a time like I do when email was introduced at work. And boy, did we have some fun on that day. That was a good day. Um, so next exercise, how many of you get, and I'm using this word get, so there's probably a better term for it, I don't mean how many of you have used, that's not what I mean. I mean how many of you get it, right? How many of you get, understand, know what it's all about? Facebook. Hands in the air. God, we're so cool, man. <laughs> yeah, we get this stuff. Yeah, I get that. I definitely get that. Uh, what about Instagram? How many of you get Instagram? Hands high so I can see you. Okay, yeah, I don't use Instagram. Well done, you're way hipper than I am. Very nice. Now then, what about Snapchat? <laughs> this is more like it, right? But it's got some, yeah, it's got some, I think we've got some young people in the middle. <laughs> and lastly, what about Twitter? I get Twitter. Yeah, use Twitter all the time. Brilliant. Okay, so we might even have some generation setters in the audience, right? So I like to think of a little story that helps me think through what makes me different from this new generation. Um, so we have to imagine ourselves, it's not difficult for you guys, imagine yourself out on the street on Southampton Row and there are fire engines and police all on the street. And this is what I do. I stop what I'm doing, I really look around and I try and figure out what on earth is going on. Probably a bit nervous and thinking it through. What does the Generation Z do? They probably get out their phone. <laughs> they probably start recording it. And the engagement they have with the technology, and this is completely different. For me, I'll go home and I'll watch the BBC News because that's my way of keeping in touch with what's happening. And later that evening, I might post a link to the BBC News article and tell all my friends that I'm safe and fine. But that Generation Z will have already recorded and shared and Snapchat and tweeted that experience because their experience of that is about the immediacy of, the, of, of it and sharing it through technology. So Facebook is a place where people of my age in general go to share kind of how well they're doing, right? <coughs> the world's pretty rosy on Facebook, isn't it? But Generation Zers are using Snapchat to share that moment in time. And it's the immediacy of the way that they use technology, which for me is, is really, really interesting. OK, I think that's you guys doing your Oh, no, there's one more bit of work for you guys. So stay awake. Um, so I think that this new generation is going to have different expectations from their time at university and that when you couple them with a lot of the technology changes that are happening in the world around us that's going to have quite profound consequences across your university system but before we get into the next part of this it would be really helpful to me just to stop and take stock of who you all are so I'd like it if you're a researcher could you put your hand up great Perfect, thank you. If you're um, in IT admin or in an IT central function, put your hand up. Oh, lots of IT people, great. Good. Uh, who am I missing? Oh, academics. How could I forget academics? Brilliant. Thank you. Well, it's great to have all of the university represented here. That's really, really, really good. So what I'm going to attempt to do is to share some reflections with you on how is Generation Z going to impact how we think about teaching and learning? What's the impact going to be on research? And lastly, how does it impact university IT and IT administration? So let's start with the student experience and teaching and learning. And um, I have got a few statistics to share with you uh, that reflect on what Generation Z is. There are sources to all of this, so I'm happy to share the deck afterwards. 
it's not from one source, which strikes me that probably there's a real opportunity to do more research in this area and find out more um, about what's driving and motivating this new group of students. So, 93% of Generation Zers. <laughs> okay, that didn't that worked. <laughs> they want a career that will make a difference, which is great, really great. When you ask them about what's most important to them, they tell you that career satisfaction is really, really important. But at the same time, they don't actually know what they want to do with their lives, which is quite tricky. And when it comes to the role of university, great news for everybody here, obviously they see university as an integral part of their future and getting a really good job. Of course, no surprise, they worry about how they're going to pay for it. From a technology perspective, they are by far the most technology advanced students there have ever been. But interestingly, they still need your support to know how to use technology to improve their learning. So though they're a technology advanced, that doesn't necessarily mean they know how best to use it with that purpose. And 72% technology believe technology can help them achieve more academically. That doesn't mean that they don't want more time with you as a lecturer. And in fact, when you look at the research, most of it confirms that they want more face time with, with the lecturer when they're studying. And this is the one part where I, I'm afraid we do go to America. <laughs> this statistic comes from the US. Um, how many of you know about these Nike ID trainers? Yeah, a few people. You got your own? Buy a few kids? Mm -hmm. yeah. God, very cool people. <laughs> So Nike ID trainers that you can actually go and customise and order from the Nike store a trainer that is bespoke and specific to you. Um, and this data point from a, a Northeastern <coughs> University shows that US students, and I guess probably UK students too, really want more control over what they study. Um, and I think that extends both to kind of the how modular the courses are that they study, um, but also how they connect into industry and other networks through their, through their study. So, if that is what the, um, what Generation Z is all about, what's, what's out there for them? Um, what's their future gonna look like? So this is a World Economic Forum report called The Future of Jobs. And it studied the impact of automation and technology and changing economies on the future. And came up with the fact that over the next five years or so, three years or so now, um, there's a really changing landscape there's new jobs emerging, as you can see. But fundamental to this is the role of technology, both within traditionally technology-related jobs, but technology as a catalyst, an innovator within all the industries that are represented here. Where jobs are going, they're often not being replaced by other people. And there are some sectors that actually won't exist in the way that we imagine them today. So this is the, obviously the driverless car that, that Google created. And although we're a little bit behind the US in this respect, it's, it's not unimaginable to think that the way we move around will look really different from the way it looks today. So perhaps that sort of agenda around what roles are going away is a bit scary 
And actually, when you look at a lot of what gets reported in the press about automation and technology, it sometimes focuses on that aspect of it. But we have to remind ourselves that technology is actually driving the kinds of changes that are really incredible. We're actually being able to solve problems that we probably thought we'd never be able to solve. And you'll see a few of those as we go through this presentation. So the, these two here, one is about bringing the internet to the billions of people on the planet who don't have it. It's quite easy for us to sit here all Wi-Fi connected and able to get it, but actually there are as many people who don't have access to the internet <coughs> as do. And this one at the bottom is about technology as a driver of preventative medicine. Asking ourselves the question, why is it that we wait for people to get ill to cure them rather than looking at what we could do to stop them getting ill in the first place? And technology is driving the kinds of solutions to these big problems that can be really transformative. How many of you know the one on the top? Great. So this is a project from um, now Alphabet, was called Google X, where Google's engineers attempt to solve really big problems. Um, and Project Loom is all about solving internet connectivity and they floated balloons up into the stratosphere to create a network that brought internet connectivity to really remote parts of the world. And then the solution down the bottom, same group of people, um, same unit within Google focused on it, is uh, developing a lens, that contact lens you wear in your eye. If you're a diabetes sufferer, it can detect when your blood sugar levels are dropping below a particular level and, and let you know that you need to do something about that. So, kind of really, really pos positive, right? Making impossible problems really possible to solve. And personally, I get excited. I mean, it's obviously it's great when Google does these things and other companies too. Um, but when young people start to do it, that's quite amazing. So this is the Google Science Fair and we run this annually. It's a competition for 13 to 18 year olds. It's open to students all over the world and they pitch um, problems that they're trying to solve for and they bring those solutions to this competition. So some of the types of um, solutions that we've seen here are things like adding natural bacteria to crop germination um, to attempt to improve crop yield obviously trying to solve the problem of, of world hunger which in itself is like wow <laughs> or there was one guy who um, came up with a method of improving our capacity to diagnose cardiac disease and these are 13 to 18 year olds so oftentimes I think we forget that when we inspire children to try to solve really big problems it's amazing what they can do and we're pretty passionate about that how do we create those kinds of learning experience that give these kids confidence to do really new and exciting things that they're passionate about. So how are we going to develop the right kinds of skills so that we develop more people able to do those kinds of things and what are the right skills to focus on? So we did some research with the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit and we asked them to go and survey business leaders, uh, 16 to 19 year olds, and uh, in this case school teachers, uh, so that we could better understand what they valued in terms of the kinds of skills they needed. And this is the results of the business leaders. Actually the um, students' results were really, really similar. And the teachers' results, and this is specific to the UK, were also similar but they did express a concern that it was very difficult to try to embed the kind of learning experiences that would focus on these top level skill developments because their curriculum was really heavy and there was a lot of knowledge acquisition required for those students to be successful in their high stakes exams. I don't think that what this is telling you is that maths or literacy aren't important. 
that's not what this is about. I think there's a foundational assumption that those things are required, but it's telling you that these other skills are super important. So I guess the reflection is, perhaps for you guys, is uh, how far are you doing things in your tutorials and lectures that really instill these kinds of skills? And is it, is, it, is it explicit? Do students really know that these are important? Important for their future, important for their careers. And how do you know that they've done them? How do you know that they're really good at team working? Have you thought about the kind of assessment models needed to understand whether they've reached a particular level? And I'll leave that one with you. <laughs> so I think those questions point to the fact that probably through the study that they are engaging with you on, they are probably learning those things. They're probably not learning it that much if this is happening all the time. Because you guys are pretty, despite my attempts to get you to share your phones and answer a few questions, you're fairly passively listening to what I'm telling you. Um, obviously difficult to see how you're developing problem solving and team working. And so we believe that trying to create more collaborative environments is going to really help them develop these kinds of skills. <laughs> And that we really need these kinds of problem-solving skills powered by technology, with technology as a tool to them, to help make sure that we have a productive, healthy workforce. <laughs> and that we shouldn't be afraid of what that might look like, because clearly, historically, we've seen that these things didn't damage us or make us less productive. And actually that swings back to Generation Z, because the Generation Zers like to have face-to-face -face time with their friends. So they know when the right time is to use their technology and when not. So the reflection then is that creating these kinds of learning experiences impacts how we learn. And that these are some of the principles that I think is going to be really important for how we think about that process. So as a student, I want to feel like this experience is targeted and personalised to me, that you know where I'm at in my study, that there's formative ways of assessing where I've reached, and that you're going to be able to help guide me in what comes next, so that I can maximise my success when I come to that summit assessment. I want to work with other people because I know that's going to be important when I get a job in the future. And I want to be able to show to the rest of the world <coughs> that I've done that. Perhaps there's badges or credentials or more formal assessment systems that help me demonstrate that skill. I want it to be flexible. And I know LSE does a really good job of this in terms of being able to dip into other courses and subjects so I get a wide appreciation of the areas that I'm interested in. But that's by no means a common theme across the UK education system. And I'd really like it to be networked, right? I'd like to be looking within my university, but I'd also like to be looking out, out into industry. So what does Google do? I'm going to tell you what I do. <laughs> um, we provide, and the area I work within, focuses on how we can bring Google's technology into classrooms in a way that helps you guys do what you need to do. And Google G Suite for education is the tool that most readily sits into this bucket of teaching and learning. And through it we provide lots of collaborative tools that if you are instilling those problem solving, teamwork, communication skills into your students, these kinds of tools help support you in your, in your goals. How many of you know about G Suite? 
Yeah, great, good. Right, so if we've said that these changes in technology and Generation Z is impacting how we learn, what about the implication on what we learn? I'm sure you guys know all about this, right? <coughs> that, um, that the digital tech economy is growing incredibly fast. It's actually growing 50% faster than the economy as a whole. And though, and though we're going to talk a bit here about um, the importance of STEM-related subjects, it's, it's not the case that that's only what we need to prepare people for. Because when you look at the data around the impact of technology on industry as a whole, it, it's no longer in the domain of the IT department. It's, it's across all functions within, within industry. So, for example, 45% of the marketing and PR industry is now deemed digital tech. And here I am as an English graduate working for Google, talking about technology. So, and I think that's really, really important. Um, and I think that the way you help students from those kinds of backgrounds prepare themselves is exactly through those other skills, problem solving and communication. So I prelude everything that's coming next with, with that comment. So we know that there is high demand, right? Double the faster job creation than the wider economy and greater numbers of jobs. And where do they source their talent from? So universities play a vital role in this, right? But when you look across the UK, um, there is a variable experience regionally in terms of whether the university is the sole graduate source or other means, for example, looking overseas. When you're actually within your career, the role of traditional universities in helping ensure that you stay up to date looks quite different from this. So they look to other places to sustain and keep their st computing knowledge or STEM knowledge um, current. So kind of an interesting reflection, right? Because you guys have a very vital relationship through their undergraduate um, careers. And when you couple that with the fact that 50% of these businesses highlight a shortage of skilled employees, there's arguably more potential to, to support this sector. And especially when you see this. So computer science enrolments actually dropped 29% between 2004 and 2013. I did, though, look at maths and science because they're also primary um, employment areas for the more technically related subjects. And interestingly, they grew uh, in the same proportion as CS declined. But what that points to is actually a flat volume of graduates coming from these subjects when we know that we're in a growing industry area. So there's still a need for a lot more graduates coming out with these, these kinds of skills. And where is the largest sector of IT that's going to need these kinds of skills? Well, it's, it's the cloud. Um, so businesses are really in a race to digitally transform. And they're moving from a model of kind of individual productivity within IT departments to a much more collaborative world of the cloud. And when you think about why they're doing that, it kind of makes sense. So number one, they need access to really highly scalable resources. Number two, they're attracted to a new type of culture of innovation. They want data information to be much more widely available. So it's not owned and closed and controlled. Um, and they want that because they want their teams to start working in a collaborative way so that they're driving new and better business ideas. They are attracted to kind of incredibly new types of 
technology capability, and we'll see a little bit more about those in a moment, things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. And lastly, it's us as users, right? We're not willing to put up with service disruptions and outages in the way that we might have done 10 years ago. We expect our technology to be on and available when and where we need it. And I guess when you think about Google, all of those concepts I've shared with you, they're kind of what make Google who we are. They're in our DNA. So Google is absolutely an innovation company and that's spurned by the way that we collaborate and work together and the culture that we have. And then when you think about the services we provide to literally billions and billions of users, we've learned how to do the cloud-based services in a way that just simply works. <coughs> and the types of companies that we're supporting are companies like Spotify. So they've actually moved quite recently from um, an on-premise capability to moving to the cloud platform. And with them, they've brought these tremendous amounts of data. Um, so 75 million plus users, 2 billion playlists, 30 million plus songs. So they're attracted by the infrastructure that Google can provide that can help them run these things efficiently and cost effectively but they're also attracted by the type of artificial intelligence that does things for you as a user that helps present that playlist, right? That knows that based on the choices you've made before, <coughs> these are the things you're going to like next. So it's that dual combination of effective, efficient IT coupled with the, the innovation part that, uh, that works. And I had to share with you, being British and struggling at times with our American colleagues there, uh, uh, phraseology as we say this is what the Spotify engineers so they said one thing that I got I understood this they said it was nearly magical when they moved to Google Cloud Platform but they also said this da bomb <laughs> yeah I'm sure that means good so <laughs> great um, so when you think about what's happening in the IT world um, we're building a kind of different kind of cloud. And the first wave in technology has all about, been all about being, having on-premise capability. The second wave was all about virtualized data centers. And in this world, it's all about me managing. You know, if you're a university, it's about me managing and owning everything I do. Uh, I'm gonna maintain it. There's physical servers um, that I have to manage and all the things that go along with that. But we now see a third wave, which is about tying automated services with scalable data. So this is all about making sure that you get access to all the storage capability, for example, when and how you need it, but that that's coupled with services like machine learning that help you do materially different things. And so, you know, what does that mean within Google to give you a sense of how it affects our developers? Our developers never write deployment <coughs> scripts, but they do publish lots and lots of code many times a day. They never write failover scripts. The IT guys will connect with this, I'm sure, right? Yeah? They never write failover scripts, and they don't patch software stacks, but they do have an incredibly secure and resilient IT service. So what it's effectively doing is it helps to relieve the developers from having to think about the infrastructure that supports the creation of all Google's amazing new products. And really, when you think about it, the same can potentially apply to universities. What if your university departments could be more oriented to driving business critical insights using the data they have about your student population as opposed to managing servers and processes linked to to them. The scale of these things is just kind of overwhelming. Um, so not only does Google, through the services we provide, obviously we have billions of users using things like Google Search, and when was the last time Google Search didn't work for you? But in addition to that, through Google Cloud Platform specifically, 
and largely through a couple of very large customers, Snapchat and Pokemon Go, we have a billion users of Google Cloud Platform. And we take this sector and the developments that are happening in IT generally really, really seriously. So much so that we're investing almost 30 billion to make sure that the infrastructure we provide delivers consistently in terms of that scalability. But that in addition, we're investing in all of those innovative project pr programs and projects that will help transform the way people do business and live their lives. So it's, it's a really significant area. And any, if you look at the IT sector generally, this is where most of the investment is, is going. So that for those of you that are not IT sector related, can feel a bit dry. It's important that we bring to life what that means in a practical sense. Um, and really it's about this, it's about helping students build what's next and being prepared. And in that regard, we re recently launched this cloud credit programme, which allows um, now European universities, as of about a month ago, to provide cloud platform to their students free of charge for teaching and learning pr purposes. So we're really excited about being able to do that because we think it's really, really important. And they're using it in courses such as these and also many others. But what do students do with it? That's what counts really, isn't it? So this is actually a Google Science Fair winner. So she started this project at school. Her name's Brittany Wenger. And she, uh, she taught herself AI, which in itself is a bit impressive. She did have a faculty mentor, so she, she got someone within the university to support her. Um, and she comes from a family that was affected by breast cancer. And obviously we know that's a, you know, I think one, about one in eight women um, are affected by breast cancer. She created an artificial neural network that she used to interrogate data sets from the University of Wisconsin. So she went and got data sets about the characteristics of women who were developing breast cancer at that time, so age, you know, lifestyle, all those sort of things that would indicate the likelihood of um, developing breast cancer, along with actual um, data uh, that was ca captured from a medical perspective, so biopsies, etc. And then she crowdsourced more data um, using App Engine to build an app that captured more information about what was happening in the wider, in the wider world. And the result was that she uh, developed this tool that has a 99.1% success rate in predicting malignant cancer. So, you know, whilst some of you, and sometimes me, might not necessarily understand quite so well the kind of technology that helps make these things possible, I'm more than keen to get excited about the way that it can have a positive contribution to, to our world. So it's, it's pretty impressive. So the other things we do in, in that vein um, to promote STEM is we do a lot of work in outreach to universities to help encourage more women, for example, to get involved in in STEM related subjects. We give travel grants, we provide scholarships. So there's, all of this is available now to, to universities. So what then, if that is the student experience, how does it impact how we think about research? <coughs> oh, wow. <laughs> So leaving that aside for the moment, and don't worry, I'm not going to tell you what each one of those icons is, so that's good news. Technology is going to provide them with so much more potential and new ways of looking at problems than they've had in the past. And the kinds of barriers to entry that have traditionally existed, the need to invest in new servers and cloud technology, um, yourself to do things on premise, they're all gone, right? Because you can get started on the cloud with no upfront cost. 
So really anyone can benefit from these kinds of, of services. And some of these areas depicted here are really driving tremendous innovation. So things like BigQuery, for example, which is one of the things here, it can provide insights into data sets in minutes that would historically have taken months or may not have even been possible to process. So again, I'll give you a real example in a minute. And the scale of it, well, all these icons do something different that researchers can benefit from. So that in itself gives you a sense of quite how many ways technology can support them. And to give you a sense of where Google fits within this mix, well, many of the services that are commonly provided through cloud, they actually started at Google. So it was, how many people know about Hadoop? Great, brilliant. So do you know the backdrop to Hadoop and Google's investment in it? Does anybody know that story yet? Yeah, so basically it was Google engineers that um, developed MapReduce, which went on to become Hadoop. And now Google's offering that as a service that customers see as Dataproc. And I guess the point here is that for all the years Google's been in existence, we've been investing and developing in these kinds of services. Many of these, and these, these um, words underneath are the internal names that Google applied to those services which are now being offered um, in a more commercial sense. So from the kind of legacy of Google's investment and role in this, in this area, it's, it's really, really significant. Right, so this will probably be a bit more practical, like how, how do we actually use it? So, there's a program running out of Stanford called the Millionaire, Million, not the Millionaire, the Million Veterans Program. And the goal of it is to create the largest genome data bank in the world. It has about half a million records of US veterans and it captures things like their lifestyle choices, it has their health records, it has their military experience, it, it captures multiple things around them. And uh, through that, the goal is that eventually there'll be a million genomic records captured and that obviously the data that we gain from that will help us to better understand the causes and potential prevention methods for, for different types of disease. And the secret of being able to learn from that data is to be able to process it. And on the on-premise versions that the Stanford department were running to, to do that processing, it took them 36 hours to process the data on one individual person. So you can imagine that the data only becomes powerful when you have a large data set so you can infer something more meaningful from it. So imagine if you were trying to process over a larger data set. It effectively makes that process completely unmanageable. But with cloud, they can simultaneously process different data sets at the same time um, and carry out, for example, 500, processing of 500 data sets in a matter of days. So these kinds of services are really transformative to what they can achieve from a research perspective. How many people are aware of of this in the news a lot lately, yeah. So this is the, um, this is CERN and it's the CMS detector. And we have recently become a partner to the high energy physics cloud, which is designed to try and bring <coughs> cloud processing across the, the community. And in a similar fashion, their problem was more related to the fact that the way that that community accessed cloud resources was very seasonal and cyclical. 
uh, and that's a common problem that many universities have if they have high performance computers for example that there are certain times where everybody wants to process data and other times where they want you know no one does so what they're doing is using <coughs> cloud services to manage the demand when their own on-premise high performance computing can't can't cope with it which means that from a researcher's perspective you're never in a position where you say oh no, I couldn't do that because there wasn't enough capacity in the system so another example of how you know the expectation is that those services are available always and then in addition to that we go out and we do work to find the next best thing we go and talk to universities about their research agenda we hold events and workshops we try and connect uh, researchers in these departments with Google engineers and we've had some amazing things happen <coughs> when when that that does happen and we have an annual faculty research award program so faculty can go online and apply and then we regularly fund UK universities with, with different levels of award so what happens to IT when Generation Z comes to university well in a similar way that you as consumers expect to have access to your technology when you want it so do our students so the expectation is that they'll be able to access their learning content anytime and anywhere and I think for the most part universities have largely responded to this I think that the certainly there's a, they're on a good path to to provide that but there's a similar benefit to university admins when they think about their infrastructure that we've seen in all those other areas right so if you could free up university IT time from managing servers and infrastructure what could the possible other areas be that they could have an impact within within the university so for example is it reasonable to imagine that we could run data analytics across LSE or other universities to detect based on all the data you capture about your students things like how many times do they go into the university library um, how many times are they coming onto campus all those different data points that we we receive to try and understand those students who are most at risk of perhaps dropping out of their studies and to then do remediation for them well before they get to a point where they're thinking about leaving or for your alumni imagine if an alumni had left obviously left the university and got their first job and perhaps they go into journalism but you know that they never did a journalism course so they're entering a career that they really have no formal qualification in what if the university was contacting them congratulating them on that success they've had but at the same time able to offer them a short course on journalism to help them feel more confident and if at the same time they could also connect them with the seven other people that went to the same university as them who'd also got a job in journalism then perhaps that would help that alumnus feel better connected and better prefer prepared for their world of work so there are very practical ways that universities could do different things with some of these tools I guess the point is that we have this potential to really convert information into intelligence and change the way we do things so <laughs> this is my son Hector we're at Heaver Castle he loves history so uh, yeah he does <laughs> exactly yeah and he's using the telephone which will probably be well I haven't got a telephone anymore um, I don't know who he's listening to at that point uh, but obviously it makes me reflect on what I'd like for him in the future and uh, I'd like to make sure that he can pursue his passion and if it's history or so be it I'm not going to fight with him about doing law um, but if it is that it's going to be super important that he builds these other kinds of skills at the same time so that when he does enter the world of work he's most likely to be successful and goodness knows 
what that future looks like, right? Or what we're going to call these people uh, and what will be those seismic shifts that I know all of us have experienced. And at that point, I'll say thank you. That's what I wanted to share with you. Thanks for uh, a very interesting and provocative talk around the uncertain futures for higher education. Uh, just a small piece of shilling that I have to do. <laughs> we have our next uh, Network to Ed session on the 14th of June. Uh, once again, here at the LSE. And we have Andy Moss, who's the Senior Vice President for Pearson Education, uh, which was actually this is previous employer yeah. <laughs> to this part uh, to work at Google. Um, but also presenting another different version of what are, are the uncertain futures for higher education. So once again, it uh, allows me the opportunity to thank Liz again for her uh, talk. So thank you. Thank you.